All right, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and this is Monday Night Bible Q&A. And uh, this is held 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That would be Florida time um, on your clocks. Uh, so if you're living in another area, another state or another country, you would uh, do well maybe to uh, kind of sync the time or get on at the, at the proper time that we're on. And it may be really, really late for you or really, really early, but uh you might want to be able to get on and join us uh, in the broadcast. That would be a blessing. And I'm going to just listen in on the broadcast here. All right. That's uh, sounding pretty good there. And as you can see, I do not have my wingman here with me uh, this evening. Uh, Justin had uh, some work he had to do. Uh, so you guys just pray for him, uh, pray that he can get everything done that he needs to get done. And we, we always do miss our brother when he's not here. Uh, so you guys pray for him and his family, if you would. And, uh, also, uh, I think, uh, other than that, just, just pray that, uh, he can get on, uh, this coming week with us. Uh, it's always a, a joy to have brother Justin on with me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to get on uh, this Q&A now. And uh, you guys pray for me since I'm uh, doing the solo tonight. Uh, pray for me that I can actually uh, answer the questions uh, satisfactorily, uh, uh, Christ honoring and Christ pleasing. Um, always want to be have a biblical mindset. And uh, and let's cover this before we dive in is uh have you thought about where your soul is going to spend eternity? I mean, if you're watching in on this broadcast, have you thought about it? I mean, uh, it's the most important thing. Uh, where will your soul spend eternity? I mean, I care about where you're going to spend eternity, but some people, you know, they think that it's based upon what I think. And I hope you don't think that it's, uh, it's going to be based upon the Holy word of God. It's going to to be based upon what God thinks. And God says that he not only sent his only begotten son through word, but he actually did that through deed. <laughs> he actually, he physically sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son to die for your sins and rise again a third day. So you and I could have eternal life, forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. What was lost in the garden can, we can now be reconciled. Humanity in Adam can now be reconciled in God through uh, the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. So uh, look into that. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, that's all you got to do. Um, it, it's not uh, one billion and one things you got to do to get right with God. Uh, you, the only way to get right with God is through Jesus, who he was already right. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get to God through Jesus and his finished cross work. Okay, so do that. Do that. Don't wait another minute. Uh, do that as soon as possible. Um, right now, if, if, if need be, right now, uh, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're, uh, if you're saved, living your life in sin, living your life the way you want to live it because Jesus died for all your sins and you can just live however you want. I don't believe that's how, G I don't believe that's the reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He didn't die on the cross for sins that you and I committed just so you can continue in the things that Jesus died for. Uh, what a shame, what a true shame it would be if you truly believe that you can live your life in the sins that you've been living your life in all this time, and you never sought the word of God, you never sought the mind of God to, to learn how God feels and what God thinks about the sins that we committed in the past, and some people are still committing. Um, we need to get out of that mindset. That's why we got a Bible. We need to get out of that mindset. We need to get into the Word of God and study the correct way 
to live our lives for Jesus Christ, not to earn our salvation, but to live the life according to what pleases God because we love God. And the least we could do is live our lives for him. And in turn, we get blessed. <laughs> what, a, what a great, you know, you get, you get a one up on both sides of the ball field. Uh, you're like, well, I can't do this anymore, but wait a minute. I always wanted to do this, but it was always sinful. Now that I'm learning how to live my life righteously, guess what? The more I'm living righteously, the more I don't want to do that anymore because I, I realize how much it hurt me in my life. I realized how much it hurt the people around me, and I realized how much it hurt God. And see, you, you just you got to learn more and more and make it a habit to live your life for Jesus. So if you're, if you're saved today, hey, get, you can still get on board. It's not too late. You can still get on board with this thing and start living a victorious Christian life and don't dwell on the past. Dwell on Jesus Christ. There's a future waiting for us with Jesus. And right now, you should make the future right now to live for Jesus Christ. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive into this thing. We're going to get to the first question here. And it is from Jose Navarro, Jose Navarro. And guys, these are not easy questions, okay? People are like wanting to do some uh, questions where Brother Ed's going to be giving some black and white answers. Uh, these questions are not easy, okay? So here's the question uh, from Jose Navarro. What does the Bible say about women being keepers of the home? I bet you everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> Should the husband be the only one bringing home the bacon? Uh, make sure it's a Tamworth because those are tasty. And the wife staying at home. And if she can work, is there restriction on the type of work she can be involved in? As far as like being a doctor for or a police officer. Thank you, brother. So uh, kind of like a, a double question here, right? Uh, women being keepers at uh, of the home, what does that mean, right? And should the husband be the only one, uh, you know, supplying, you know, the household with livelihood? And then, uh, and can she work? And, and if she does work, uh, is there any kind of type of restriction or sanction on the type of work she can can do or be involved in? Uh, and then he gives an example, like uh, being a doctor or police officer. I I would say maybe not a doctor, uh, so to speak. I mean, there is, I guess there would be somewhat of a, a usurping authority there. I mean, if you were the, the supervisor of all the doctors, you know, or, you know, or just being the doctor and, and, uh, and a man coming in to your office and you're the woman doctor and you're telling him what to do. Like, I don't know. I guess if you want to consider that usurping a some form of authority, but I mean, if she's helping you to save your life, <laughs> okay, so um, let's go ahead and dive into this thing. I I, I kind of thought that maybe we could stick in President of the United States, <laughs> right? As far as like being the President of the United States or a police officer or a lawyer, <laughs> you know, stuff that actually deals with you know telling people what to do, you know. Um, so let's go. Let, let let me let me dive into this. You guys pray for me as I answer this question. I know a lot of times through political correctness and through the norm of the norms of society, people tend to hold on, even as even as Christians, they tend to hold on to what they've always known through society as a Gentile, unsaved, but still looked at the moralities of society, and they hold on to these moralities and even even though maybe some of them may seem good, they may seem very, very moral and ethical. Um, they may be completely wrong concerning the word of God. And you've got to take the word of God as a Christian, because that's what makes you a Christian. You've got to take the word of God above society, and you've got to take the word of God above what you believe. Come on, as a Christian, you've got to take the word of God above, above what you believe the norm of what a reasonable person would be in in as a Christian, uh, and 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 you've got to basically you've got to contrast that with what society says, and what you got to tell yourself is if society has this thing that I've always believed that seemed to be right, and the Word of God is contradicting that, then 
I've got to take the word of God. I've got to stand on the side of God. I've got to stand on the Lord's side. Okay, now sometimes an area like this can be really kind of a gray area, but then it's not a gray. I, I'll explain what I mean by that. It can be a gray area, but it's not a gray area. It, it sounds like a gray area, but then when you start covering verses in the Bible, it tends to kind of go past the gray area to where, wait a minute, I, I kind of know what I need to do, <laughs> right? Um, as opposed to me, Brother Ed being the guru to go to and me telling you it's this, <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what people want when they get on my broadcast or they ask me questions. They, they're like, and, and, and by all means, ask questions. I'm not, I'm not knocking anybody down from asking questions. What I'm saying is sometimes you can get into a mode when you got a guy to go to to ask questions. You can kind of tend to go to that. That's my go-to guy to answer all my questions objectively in black and white answers. And I'm not, tonight it's going to be Bible verses and you've got to decide for yourself on what side you're going to stand on concerning these Bible verses, because there is not a hardcore line drawn on Jose Navarro's question here. OK, um, we have a lot of verses we can consider. We have a lot of principle we can consider and then look at these objectively and reasonably in the Bible in Christian conduct. And then you judge for yourselves on what you need to do. OK. Because I am not on here to preach to you objectively on what to do in these areas. I want you to let the word of God talk to you and speak to you as we read the verses. And then you be persuaded concerning the scriptures on what you need to do. Okay. So you guys uh, just be ready for that. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to try my best to be careful with how I answer, you know, these questions here from Jose Navarro and all the other questions that are very kind of, uh, not black and white answers, but that we we cover these things reasonably and uh, rightly dividing the word of truth in the light of integrity in the scriptures. And and we always got to uh, always got to bring this up because people think it's not necessary. It is necessary that when we bring uh, any any kind of Christian conduct to the table uh, concerning somebody's question, we've always got to be Christ centered. It's not just salvation, okay? In Christian conduct, it's got to be Christ-centered. It has to be. Because you can end up in a number of false beliefs in the Bible if you're not Christ-centered. I've seen people do it a lot of times. Black Hebrew Israelites, they use a King James Bible, and they preach a lot of things that the verses they're preaching are correct, but they're completely, totally out of context, number one, and number two, it's not Christ-centered. It's racially centered. You see, the motivation behind the verses is going to make a huge uh, impact on the interpretation of the scriptures. So if you're not Christ-centered, because what is all, come on, what does the Holy Spirit do? He testifies and glorifies of Jesus Christ. He does, the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself. He speaks of Jesus Christ. Read John 16, 8. Read John 14. OK, uh, so we need to be very careful how we handle the scriptures as we cover something like this. OK, so uh, let's go ahead. I, I, enough of the I'm still going to lay some more groundwork down. OK, now, Job 912, I'm just just some groundwork. I'm going to lay real quick. OK, Job 912 says, behold, he taketh away who can hinder him. That's God. Who will say unto him, what doest thou? Who could stand before the holy, mighty God and ask him the question, what doest thou? The creator of the universe, the creator of the brain. Who could ever ask? The one that created your very brain inside your head, inside your skull. Who could ask this God? <laughs> Not any false God, but the God, what doest thou? And which brings us to the cross reference in Ecclesiastes 8.4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? So when, when we're talking about women, right? We're talking about women uh, in authoritative positions, right? Um, can, we, can we go up to God and say, well, God, even though you may have uh, placed um, certain distinctions upon men and women, but what, what doest thou? What doest thou? Um, we don't have to listen to what you do. We don't have to obey 
what you say we have to obey, but we're going we d- to decide for ourselves in what's acceptable in society and what's not acceptable in society. Now, this this becomes a lot bigger than what I'm saying because as a Gentile with that mentality, it bleeds into the church once one gets saved, correct? That mentality is still there, and it has to be little by little. It's a shame it has to be little by little. I mean, some people gain more ground after they're saved because they're more uh, willing to obey more than others. I mean, we can't put everybody in a box. Everybody's different. So everybody grows in different spiritual temperaments. So not everybody's going to give God everything. You know what I mean? So you've got to be careful with how you box every, every believer up. People grow differently. Some people stay stagnant for a long time. Some people grow exponentially right when they get saved. And so you've got to be really careful with, with how you handle that. So you'll, you may have a woman that is more obedient to the word of God. She may uh, change her outward appearance, but her inward, her inward is still lacking. Her inward still struggling. And then you may have a woman that inwardly, she's really humble, real meek, quiet spirit. Uh, but outwardly, she's still struggling with how uh, to dress in modest apparel. <laughs> so then you have a woman, she may be a meek and quiet spirit and dress modestly and have have it all, may struggle in other areas. So you know, I don't think any of us got it all figured out. I don't think any of us do. Okay. But Certainly, there should be a desire, right? There should be a desire from everybody to grow at the pace they're growing. And I believe that you can you can decide for yourself how fast you want to grow. You're not God doesn't put limitations on how fast you can grow. But I think a lot of times we put limitations on ourselves because we we struggle in areas of our lives concerning sin. We struggle in areas of our lives because there's a lot of areas in our lives that we think are still justified to do, and we kind of bump heads with the scriptures and say, well, I just don't see it that way. I don't see what Brother Ed is saying about that. I don't see what my pastor is saying about it. I don't see what the when, the, when I read the verse in the Bible, I don't see what that's dealing with in my situation concerning how I'm seeing that verse, or I'm seeing that that conduct that I'm supposed to be uh acting in in accordance with. So that becomes a huge issue, doesn't it? When you have, we're supposed to be like-minded in the church, but you have all of these different kind of views that are kind of bumping heads inside the congregation concerning more trivial things that are going to be based upon our own our own minds and our own persuasions of the scriptures. So there are things that are completely obvious Come on, there's a lot of obvious things concerning Christian conduct in the Bible that none of us should argue about. And if one of us is arguing about it, then obviously there's some rebuke and some reproof going on there. But then there's other things that are just like, well, it's okay to have a different view on this, but um, just make sure that you have a scriptural view, rightly divided view. And then a lot of times when a pastor's teaching and preaching on these certain areas, it kind of helps clear the fog out because you're getting rightly divided teaching from a man that has real experience in the scriptures and in his life. Go to church. Get under a pastor. <laughs> Brother Ed here on the Bible q and is just a supplement, okay? You need to be in a tr- in your local church, going to church in a local called out assembly. That'd be a great thing, okay? So that's going to help you too, all right? So now that we did that, I want you to go to Romans 2. Now, remember, our question is, go to Romans 2. And while you're going to Romans 2, I'm going to, you know, our, we're going to recap some of this. Should the husband be the only one bringing home the bacon, the wife staying at home? And and if she can work, is there a restriction on the type of work she can be involved in? And then this is kind of where we're going to be covering right now. And then we're going to move. We're going to kind of move backwards to the first part of the question as far as like being a doctor or a police officer. Thank you, brother. So we're going to hit like, you know, the the woman usurping authority, right? That's kind of where we're going to head right now, okay? So let's cover some of this. Romans 2, 14 to 15. A reason why I'm covering this, it's more foundational. 
and it says, for when the Gentiles, it's uh, Romans 2, 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves. Do the Gentiles have a law? Not a written law, but they have a law, don't they? Now look at verse 15, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bear witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Okay, so they do have a law and it's written in their hearts and their conscience bears witness of that law. But the problem is their thoughts, their thoughts. That's why you have a verse 16 in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, because God's not going to let you get away with your thoughts. You, your, your heart that has God's law written on it, you can override that law by your thoughts. You can say, well, I, I know it's right. I, I know my conscience is violated, but I'm just going to go with my thoughts. That's Jeremiah 17, 9, isn't it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's a, that's a hard place to be, but it still leaves you with no excuse. That's why you're going to be judged. Okay, so uh, we have Romans 2.14, do by nature the things contained in the law. The law is written in the hearts of the Gentiles. The conscience bears witness of the law in the Gentiles. So Romans 1.26 says the natural use into that which is against nature. Remember that? So we're dealing with nature. I want you to understand this. We're dealing with nature. So there are things that we know by nature. And then uh, right here, Romans 126, it talks about uh, concerning a man with a man or a woman with a woman that are using these things against nature. So there's things that we know by nature that we don't need a Bible for. You don't need a Bible for this. You already know this by nature. And then uh, 1 Corinthians eleven 14, I'm only going to give you a few. I'm just trying to prove a point. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 uh, says, uh, nature teaches it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Okay. We're not going to get into this whole man hair discussion, but I just want to want to show you something about nature. You don't need a preacher. You don't need Brother Ed telling you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. You don't need me. You don't need anybody else. Um, you can, without anybody telling you anything, nature teaches you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what I'm saying is probably offensive to a lot of people, but nature teaches you this. And nobody, you don't need to go to university to know this. You don't need to go to elementary school or high school. You know, none of that. Nature. Nature. It's rudimentary. Nature teaches you this, okay? Now, there are things that nature teaches you. We, we've talked about that. And when we get to the woman thing, there is a, some nature going on there, the nature of a man, the nature of a woman. A man is not a woman and a woman is not a man. Things that are different are not the same. You wouldn't think I needed to say that, but <laughs> in this day and age, you got to say that. Things that are different are not the same. God called a man a man. God called a woman a woman. It's called the law of identity. Um, it's We use it in the laws of logic uh, to, to determine if somebody's rational or irrational, somebody belongs in a funny farm or doesn't belong in a funny farm. Uh, we don't need to go to the descriptives of what a man is because a man is a man and a woman is a woman. And yes, you can go to the descriptives, but um, a man is a man. I shouldn't have to go to the descriptives to determine if a woman is a woman, but uh, uh, your your universities are teaching you that, that you can't tell the difference. Nobody can tell the difference. And so that's, no, there's distinctions of a woman. There's distinctions of a man. All right. Now, uh, I, I'm going to say we're going to put this all together in the end. Okay. So for now, go to Isaiah 3, 9. I want to show you something. Isaiah 3, 9. Isaiah 3, 9 in the King James Bible. Now, the Bible says, I st started at a paragraph mark there just to get a little context there. But my my uh, my object verse, my my focus verse is Isaiah 3.12, okay? So we're going to get there. Uh, Isaiah 3.9 says, the shoe of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not, woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous, 
then it shall be well with him, for they shall eat of the fruit of their doings. See, you're going to reap what you sow, correct? That's Galatians 6, 7. Uh, that's sowing and reaping. It was brought forth in the garden. Sowing and reaping. That is God's one of God's laws concerning after man sinned, what was brought into effect. Sowing and reaping. Now, uh, Isaiah 3.11, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, my people, that's the nation of Israel, children are their oppressors. Children. And women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. And, uh, err is the root word of error, right? And destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. What, what are women doing ruling over them? What are children doing being their oppressors? That comes from a long line of sinning against God. Correct? Not obeying the word of God. If you were obeying the word of God, none of this stuff would be happening. But what are we noticing right here? That uh, women ruling over them is not acceptable. <laughs> women ruling, usurping authority is not acceptable in the Old Testament concerning God's government for the nation of Israel. It's not acceptable. Now, that's the only verse that I really have as a... Uh, you know, kind of kind of an appeal to uh, a governmental clause concerning God's uh, ordained method of government. And again, we're dealing with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and some may push push the you know the idea that well, that's just Old Testament, that's not New Testament. But I appeal that this is how God views it. So we're going, let, let's zoom out a little bit out of the context a little bit, and let's just look at how God created women. How did God create men? Okay, now I want you to pay attention to that. Now watch. God chose a king in Israel, not a queen. God wanted a king, not a queen. God chose man to be head of the home, not a woman to be the head of the home. God chose bishops and deacons, not bishopesses, or how do you call them? Bishopesses and deaconesses, right? So that's a uh, Titus 1 6, if any be blameless. Now watch. The wife of one wife. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says the husband of one wife. Wouldn't it be scary if it said wife of one wife? Yeah, your homosexuals would have a great verse to go to. It says the husband of one wife, not the husband of many wives, as polygamists would like to. Uh, and Mormons would like to, to think that as, but it is actually the husband of one wife, not one wife at a time. It's one wife, one, that's it. You got more than one wife, you don't qualify. Having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, this is the husband of one wife, not the wife of one wife, exactly. So the God of the Bible always establishes with male leadership. It's the patriarchy. That's the bad word of, of the social construct of today. It's the biblical principles that God has laid out that a family could be blessed, a church could be blessed, a nation could be blessed, and how the blessings will bleed over into the millennial reign, into eternity. Yes, the God of the Bible always establishes with male leadership, his government for his chosen people and leadership for his church, never, never with female leadership. Oh, I don't like this. I'm a female. I'm a safe woman. I don't like that. Well, that's fine. You don't have to like this. I've never, I never said that this broadcast was going to be likable. Okay. If we're looking for truth, we're looking for truth and I'm going to preach the truth. Okay. I'm not here to tickle your, your, the back of your ear. Okay. I'm here to give you the truth of the word of God. It may not be favored. It may not be popular. It, it, it actually may draw people to not you know, follow me anymore and, and unfriend me. And that's fine. Um, I'm standing on the word of God. I'm trying to be as rightly divided as I can be and reasonable as I can be concerning the scriptures. Okay. So God's position on women concerning now, now, now look at this one. Barak uh, won't go. So Deborah goes, remember that Barak and Deborah, God wanted Barak to go, but Barak didn't go. So who went in Barak's stead? 
a woman, a woman went in Barak's stead. Now, I want you to be careful. When you when when people go to the Old Testament, they like to say, well, you know, you got the prophetess and uh, you've got, you know, we just mentioned Deborah, the judge. So watch this. I want you to pay attention to some of this. Now, do you remember Miriam, the prophetess? You say, well, see, Miriam was a prophetess, and you go to Exodus 15, 20 to prove that. Then you'd go to Judges 4, 4, and you say, well, Deborah was a judge. We just mentioned that, right? Then you go to 2 Kings 22, 14, you'll say, Huldah was, was the prophetess at the time. And then you go to Nehemiah 6, 14, Nodiah was a prophetess. You know, these are all women with leadership positions, right? And then you'd go to the uh, a prophetess that had no name in Isaiah 8, 3. And you say, well, see, she was there. And you go to Luke 2, 36, and you say, Anna, we mentioned Anna. Anna of the prophetess. Then you go to Revelation 2.20. Jezebel calls herself a prophetess and is uh, and is fulfilled in the, in the future kingdom, right? Her being that prophetess. So you say, look at all these prophetesses speaking from God, and they were in leadership positions. And you know what? I had that argument one time. I was at work, and I was we were we got on the discuss this very discussion about women usurping authority over a man, a woman being a pastor in a church, right? And we got on this topic and I I've I got an earload full of all of these cross references here to all of these women in the as prophetesses and you had this one judge, right? Now here's here's what I did. I went home and I was like, you know, I just don't think that's right because God doesn't establish a women in leadership positions because he basically contradict his own word. So what I did was I looked at the time period in Miriam's life in Exodus 15:20. And you know what I found? You know what I found in Exodus 15, 20? I found that Miriam was the prophetess at the time, but who was the high priest? Who was the high priest? That It was Aaron. If you go to Exodus 28, 1, you'll see that Aaron, at the time of Miriam being the prophetess, um, Aaron was the high priest. He was in that leadership position. In Judges 4, 4, when Deborah was the judge, uh, Barak, Barak was supposed to be in that leadership position, right? Judges 5.12. And then in, in 2 Kings 22.14, hold of the prophetess, she was there. But at the same time, uh, Hilkiah was the high priest. He was in the leadership position uh, concerning uh, the priesthood. And that was 2 Kings 22.8. In Nehemiah 6.14, Nodiah was the prophetess, but Eliashib was the high priest at the time of Nodiah. And that was Nehemiah 3.1. And Isaiah 8, 3, there was a prophetess that had no name that we've just mentioned. Well, guess who was the high priest at that time? It was Uriah. That was in Isaiah 8, 2 at the same time. And then Anna was the prophetess in Luke 2, 36. But guess who was the high priests, plural? It was Annas and Caiaphas. That was Luke 3, 2. And in Revelation 2, 20, um, that was something in the future time. And they ain't got nothing to do with the church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you go. And so, so you see, see what we're talking about? People want to push this agenda of this, you know, political correctness and this this social brainwashing that you know women are equal to men in the sense of everything. They're not. Men are men and women are women. Okay, now 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 come on. Let's do this. I I I don't normally do this, but sometimes you got to do this. Is there a women Olympics? Shouldn't it be Olympics for all? No, because men would have an advantage. Why? Why do you think? <laughs> uh, is Why is there women boxing? Shouldn't it be all boxing? Shouldn't men be in the, in the ring with women? How about mixed martial arts? You know, men with women, mixed martial arts. Well, the men would have an advantage. Why is that? Because God made a man a man. He made a woman a woman. Come on. That's this guy's all about the patriarchy. This guy's a, a what, what do they call him? What do they call him? Now? I can't even think of the name. I don't, I don't, I don't even want to remember the name. How about that? So you have women gymnastics. Women gymnastics. Why not men and women gymnastics? Why not one field for everybody? Well, because men would have an advantage. Well, you think so? Women weightlifting competitions. <laughs> well, women can do everything a man. Well, why don't you put the weightlifting competitions together? 
No, you, you don't do that because a man is a man and a woman is a woman. It is never okay for a woman to say that she's equal to a man. And it's never okay for a man to try to be feminine like a woman. God didn't make you that way. He made you a man. God made a woman a woman. People want to argue about these lines that are so objectively objective. <laughs> All right, go to 1 Corinthians 11. Go to 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's a good, that's a good rule to live by, isn't it? If, if you're following somebody that's following Christ, that's great. Keep following him. He turns from Christ. Hey, better lose that guy. Go find somebody that's following Christ or just go directly to the source and follow Christ himself. And that way you can tell other people, Hey, follow me as long as I'm following Christ, but don't follow me if I'm not following Christ anymore. Good rule to live by. Now, I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Will you keep them? Will you keep them? Well, I only want to keep the ones I want to keep. <laughs> all right. I can't help you then. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. You know, he just said in verse 2, You remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. And right after that, he says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that the, the, the woman or the, the man is the head of the woman. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Well, then you can't claim verse two that you're going to keep the ordinances as Paul delivered them unto you under divine inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You can't say that you, you're you going to obey that. I mean, people want to be Christians, but they only want to obey what they want to obey. You got to obey everything and be rightly divided. I mean, don't sit there and say, I obey everything. And then you're sitting here, you're, you're obeying things that are in the tribulation time when we're not even in the tribulation because I'm not going to be there and you're not going to be there. If you're saved, we're going to be up in the rapture. So you got to watch out how you rightly divide this thing. Okay. All right. So we covered something objective about headship, the place of the woman and the place of the man. God placed these distinctions here. And there, there is God's divine order in the household, the, the divine order in the family, the divine order for the church, the divine order for humanity, the divine order for his government, the divine order for eternity. That's God. God has placed these things on earth. Now, can we, by our own free wills, do what we want to do? Sure. <laughs> you can disobey every verse in the Bible. God has given you the freedom of volition and free will. You can disobey everything in the Bible. God won't stop you. But you're going to reap what you sow, my friend. And as you see in our culture today, there's a lot of reaping what people have been sowing all these years, all these decades in this country. And you can see uh, people are always like, you know, God has blessed this country. Has he? Look around you. Has he? Galatians or, uh, or Genesis 3.16 says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall, what? Rule over thee. There is a distinction in the household. There is a divine order in the household. God has placed it there all the way back in Genesis. And it was not just for the church. Was, was Adam a Gentile? Yes. Was Eve a Gentile? Yes. Go to Genesis 10, 5 if you don't believe me. It says in, let, let's do it. Go, go to Genesis 10, 5. I'm trying to, trying to quote something here that I don't rightly remember or verbatim. Now look, uh, concerning Noah, Ham, Shem, uh, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, Genesis 10, 1, and you go down to Genesis 10, 5, by these were the owls of the Gentiles divided. There were no Jews back then. There were only Gentiles. So anything, so you can count anywhere from that time on back, and you can even go a little bit forward from there as well. But, it, but Genesis 10, 5, you've got, a, you've got a starting point right there where Gentiles were first mentioned, and you can trace everything all the way back to Adam and Eve. Everybody before that point in time were Gentiles. 
That's how we discern that. Adam was not a Jew. Adam was not an Israelite. All right. So now that you know that, so why is that important? Because we're not dealing with the nation of Israel right now. We're not dealing with the church right now. We're dealing with God's order for humanity. And God's order for humanity is that the man would be the head of the household. It's not, it's, come on, I didn't say that Adam would be the taskmaster to, to enslave his wife. I didn't say that. <laughs> the order of the household is the divine order. See, Christ is the head of the church. He doesn't whip us. He doesn't beat us. <laughs> he loves us. He gave his life for the church. So people's understanding of this is all skewed. It's all because of the civil rights in, in America and all this slavery and all this stuff. People's mind is in the carnal. It has nothing to do with scripture. You got to get, you got to get biblically mind set it in the scriptures. All right. So look at first Timothy two ten. Now, now you see all of this is starting to, now we got some background. We got some groundwork laid. Um, now go to first Timothy two ten. Now watch this. Um, go back to verse nine, first Timothy two, nine. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but with, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. What kind of a woman would be a woman professing godliness? Probably somebody that's godly, correct? Somebody that obeys the scriptures, correct? Look at verse 11. It's going to give you more descriptions of a godly woman. Look at verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. It didn't say let some women learn in somewhat silence unless they want to speak sometimes with some subjection. We would like it to say that, right? Oh, and as a woman, would you like it to say that? <laughs> that might be the the Queen James Bible version for the homosexuals, but no, it doesn't say that in the King James Bible. It says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection, verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, uh, I understand the context. We're dealing with the church. That's the context. We're dealing with the church. My question to you is, when we get to verse 13 and 14, and 15, what are your thoughts going to be then about the context? Let's read verse 13. The next verse, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. Well, Adam wasn't part of the church. Eve wasn't part of the church. Look at verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. That had nothing to do with the church. It has something to do with how sin was brought into the world and how the distinctions came into being, why a woman needs to be silent and why a man is the has headship in the household and in the church. Uh, look at verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, charity, and charity, and holiness with sobriety. Uh, that is a whole sermon in itself in verse 15. We are not going to cover that, okay? But I just read, I just want to read the whole context. So you see, there's no tricks here. So we, we're talking about the church from verse 12 all the way to verse, all the way back to verse one. It's dealing with the church, conduct concerning the church. But it goes back to the beginning with Adam and Eve. Now, this is what I would say when we were talking about what kind of a woman would be a woman that professes godliness. And it traces it all the way back to Adam and Eve and why a woman that's godly, because she has to not usurp authority over the man and to be in silence and teaching and all this. When you get all of that context and then you bring it to why in verse 13 down to 15, you see why is because of God's order concerning sin from the beginning. So this is supposed to be inherited sanctions that are dealing with the human nature of a woman and a man. And that carries throughout Humanity, not just the church. All right, do you see why I read Romans 2? 
because there's laws written in the heart and there's nature within man that says that these things are so without anybody ever uh, reading a Bible verse. <laughs> you see why we covered all of that as foundational? Uh, that's very important uh, that we understand all of these facets of groundwork and foundation so we can understand where we're going, where we're dealing with these women here. And a woman that's godly isn't going to argue with what we're talking about right here, because just as much law and sanction for women is as I mean, men have their sanctions and laws as well. There's a lot of things that are dealing with just men that men have to take care of. So you can't sit there and say God's just targeting women because God's just this maniacal, patriarchal, you know, God that's egocentric because he's all about, you know, uh, men, 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 men. No, God, if a woman would accept her place as given, as, as men would accept their place as given by God, come on, if both would accept their place given by God, there, there would be blessing. There would not, be nothing but blessing. It's not one is belittled above the other. It's about how a tiger is not a bird. So a tiger gets mad at the bird because the bird can fly, but God made the bird with wings. Why are you getting mad at the bird? <laughs> so a man is a man and a woman is a woman. There's biological differences between the two. And God made it so. There's gender differences between the two. And no, we're not going to get into some subjective gray area lines that you're your media and all that, all these people in this day and age want to talk about. We're talking about objective truth concerning humanity. So if you can accept all this concerning the word of God, then it's not going to, it's going to be really easy as a woman to be able to discern these things. It's not going to be hard. It's not. It's, it's being accepted by your society, being accepted by groups of people, this tribal stuff. Um, that's what's the problem is right now. People just want to be accepted and they, they end up engulfing themselves in these discussions, in these ideal uh, ideologies, and they get stuck in there. And then they, they listen to it so much that it becomes the norm of their thinking. And these people, a lot of these people are Christians. They're saved. They're, I don't say they're Christians. They're just, let's just say they're saved members of the body of Christ. So let's move on here. People want to say uh, Galatians 3.28, right? There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor female nor female. You're all one in Christ. And they take that, they wrongly divide it, and they want to say, well, see, there's no more distinctions anymore. You know, a man, a man and a woman are one. No, it doesn't say man and a woman are one. It says you're one in Christ. There's a big difference. We're talking about salvation in Christ. We're all one in Christ. But man and woman still have their distinctions in this life, in this body of flesh. All right, so uh, we can't cover a whole lot of this. I, I wanted to answer this question. This may be the only question we get to tonight because it's, it's packed full, and I don't want to leave it undone here. So I want you to look at this. In 1 Timothy 2, 9, because we were just in 1 Timothy, right? 2. Um, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So what kind of a woman would do that? A police officer? A woman police officer? A woman mountain climber? I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing stuff out there. But modest apparel. What does that mean to you? I mean, I'm not going to sit here because a lot of some preachers, they, they really dive into this. They want to find something to control what a woman wears. I understand that, but um, you're going to have to let them read those verses themselves and decide for themselves what this means. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Look at 1 Peter 3 1. Go to 1 Peter 3 1. I want you to look at these verses. 1 Peter 3 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. A woman can't even preach to her own husband the word of God so he can get saved. You know what the Bible tells a woman to do? She has to win her husband with her conduct. 
She can't even preach the world. We're, look, come on, we're not even talking about president of the United States as a woman or police officer as a woman. She can't even win her own husband by the word of God coming out of her mouth. She's got to win him by her conduct. Now, 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 step back. Come on, step back with me a little bit here. And I want you to look from a distance. Look, look from a distance out. We read the verses. Now, now move back a little bit. Now, if a woman cannot even preach to her own husband the word of God, and she's got to win him by her conduct, if, if the man's lost, okay, the man's lost and undone, her husband's lost and undone, she cannot win him by the word. She's got to win him by her conduct. Now, zoom out. Now, this woman is going out to her police officer job, and she's telling people, you got to obey the law. You got to obey this. You got to obey that. Uh, I'm going to arrest you. Put you in handcuffs because you didn't obey the law. And the, and and who she's arresting? Probably most of them are men. <laughs> well, brother Ed, what are you saying? I'm not, I'm just saying. Just think about that. Think about that for a minute. The woman can't go home and teach her her husband about through her mouth the word of God. Hey, honey, can you open up the Bible to? Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. She can't even do that. Well, you know, I'm over here talking about a, a woman that professes godliness that actually is professing godliness and being godly. Um, how many of those women actually exist? I don't know. Um, I have, I have yet to see one, meet one. Maybe I don't know one that actually does that. I mean, most women will, will, will grill their husband's Honey, you better get saved. If you don't get saved, what I don't know what I'm going to do. Honey, honey, next day, honey, you got to get saved. Honey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Honey, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> That's not the Bible. So, you know, we're just speaking hypothetically. I mean, I hope I'm, I hope it's not hypothetical. I hope more women are actually obeying 1 Timothy, you know, 2, 9. And, and 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 ten and so forth and uh first peter three or first peter three one i hope more more women are doing that but um most women the women that i know they're, they'll preach to their husbands they'll 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 give them a whole lecture they'll give them a whole sermon at home um i'm just saying if we want to be we want to be biblical right biblical in our mindset and i'm just i'm just trying to show you about Getting jobs on the outside? I mean, shouldn't your Christian conduct from within display what you are outwardly to the Gentiles and to the heathen and the rest of the world? Shouldn't your conduct be in the sense of, of honoring Christ, whether you're in the church or outside of the church? I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not telling you you have to do this or that. I'm telling you to think about this. Think about the principles we're talking about, and you've got to decide. You got to decide, is there enough here for me to make an objective decision on what, what I should do in my job as a woman? And, 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 you know, are we reconciling what we do in the church with what we do outside for the unbelievers? So look at, look at this. We did first Peter three, one. Now look at first Peter three, two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, if you got to do that with your own husband, you, you don't do that with other men that are, I mean, come on, think about it. You're a woman, right? We're talking about women here. Uh, you're, uh, well, come on, what are you going to do? While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, you only do that for your husband. But everybody else, you can tell them what to do. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm talking about being consistent as a woman, uh, and that's all I'm talking about, being consistent in Christianity, under Christian conduct, in the New Testament, as a saved member of the body of Christ. 1 Peter 3.3, 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel, except if it be for a uniform, a military uniform, and you're the captain of your section, and you're telling everybody, you go over here, flank them over there. <laughs> Come on now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just throwing, I'm throwing ideas out there. I want you to think about them, okay? I'm not making anybody, I'm not telling everybody they're wicked and going to hell. I'm, we're not, we're, we're not talking about salvation right now. We're talking about conduct. 
becoming of a woman that professes godliness, right? All right, so verse 4, 1 Peter 3, 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is, which is in the sight of God a great price. How, how are you supposed to, come on, how are you supposed to be an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit? How are you supposed to be an ornament of that? If you're over there usurping authority over a man in all your Gentile jobs, I thought Christians are supposed to be Christians 24-7. Think about that. Think about that. If I'm at home as a man, okay, and I'm supposed to be the head of my household, and I'm supposed to be the man, right? And I go out and I'm doing feminine things. I'm, you know, I'm doing wicked things that deal with homosexuality and all that. Would that be acceptable? Would that be okay? I'm just saying, you know, I mean, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Now, the reason why I'm very kind of subjective with what we're saying, and I'm giving you the verses and letting you decide uh, as you're reading the verses, if you're a woman today, or even if you're a man trying to learn this, uh, this these ideas, uh, is the fact that you're going to have a lot of circumstances. You're going to have a lot of gray areas in people's lives. You're going to have anecdotals where people are going to, you know, come up to you and say, well, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you one example. What if you have a woman, right? And, uh, and her husband died and now she has to take care of her kids. She has to be the breadwinner in her household. What do you do in that situation? Well, the woman has to, you know, usurp authority there, right? Come on. So, you, you understand that uh, some of these aren't as black and white as we would like them to be, but you can see I'm giving you a lot of the principles in the Bible that you can uh, basically use to me as a measuring rod to decide each situation. So that's, that's what we want to do here. Okay. So let's go to verse five for after this manner in, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, and that's verse seven, first Peter three, seven, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So since we are not living in the millennial reign to eternity, we have to deal with Gentile governments and their laws presently. If the woman's husband dies, she is now the head of the house. As we said before, if a Christian woman is running for president, of the United States of America against a communist sodomite man. Guess who I'm voting for? <laughs> I'm going to vote for the Christian woman, right? These are situations that I'm talking about. You've got to be careful with how you make these things like black and white, because some of these aren't black and white as we'd like them to be. Okay. So I hope that we did kind of a decent job. We didn't do a thorough job on this. I mean, there's so much that can be said about this. And I just want you to, to understand that each, sometimes people's situations can kind of hinder the black and white view that we have. So we've got to watch out not to be so dogmatic about a certain view in the Bible, even though we've got a lot of clear stuff here. Um, we've got to watch out to have grace with people that are in certain circumstances because of the sin they're, they're in, or maybe they have been in, in the past and that they're, they may be trying to get right, but they're stuck. They're stuck where they're at. You see what I'm saying? So let's not be so dogmatic as to, to not be gracious and not be merciful to people that are really trying to get right with God or, or trying to live a Christian life with what they have. I mean, they've probably got a lot of messed up lives, but they're trying their best to do with what they have. Okay. So uh, that's what I, I, I want you to have grace with people. I know we went through a lot of verses that you could be dogmatic on and you could really pull these things to the point where you could just be hateful to people and just throw people out of your church. I mean, come on, really? I mean, didn't Jesus Christ have grace with us? Wasn't there many times in our lives where we we come short of the word of God, not, not knowing what we ought to be doing in certain areas of our lives? I mean, if God would have been like us, not having any mercy or grace, probably none of us, none of us would be saved right now. God's, God has mercy. God has grace. And as a grown, meaty Christian, 
I say meaty, right? Come on, discerning good and evil. You, you should be able to have grace with that discernment. All right. So uh, hopefully you, you, you understand that. And now let's go to some of this, uh, you know, can a woman work? Okay. And uh, we're going to end it with this whole part of the women, you know, what can a woman do and so forth, right? Uh, can a woman work outside the home? I want you to I want you to go to Proverbs 31. Go to Proverbs 31 in your Bible, okay? Nowhere, I'm going to say this while you're looking, Proverbs 31. And I want you to, uh, you're going to start in verse 10. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Nowhere in the Bible does it say women must exclusively work from home. They can work from home or work from anywhere else, okay? If they want to work at home, they can work at home. There's no sanction in the Bible that says they can't. They want to work outside the home, they can work outside the home. There's no sanction in the Bible that says they can't. Well, don't the Bible say that they have to be keepers at the home? Well, uh, you got to define that. You got to read that in its context. We got to define what keepers at home means, right? So go to Proverbs 31 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? You know, nowadays, you got women who don't even know they're women now, or so they claim. You know, didn't we just say that nature itself teaches you a lot of things? Uh, you got women questioning if they're women. That's sad. That is sad. Who can find a ver uh, first, first, you got to ask yourself, who can find a woman? <laughs> <laughs> and then when you when you try to go to the four leaf clover, I mean, I want to use Irish traditions here. <laughs> you got to look for the four leaf clover. Who can find a virtuous woman? <laughs> for her price is far above rubies. How about a very 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 rare ruby? Come on, you you want to find a virtuous woman? You better hold on tight. Hold on tight. Proverbs 31, 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Can, can you imagine that? Having a relationship where you can trust your wife. You can trust your wife. She's a virtuous woman. And you can say that. You can testify that. Isn't that great? And you can actually say, instead of speaking bad about your wife, you can actually say her price is far above rubies. You know what I can say about my wife today is, Brother Ed, my wife's price is far above rubies. I can say that. I can trust my wife. It's a very rare thing. If you got a wife like that, you better glory in God because you found a good wife. Proverbs 31, 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. You know, my wife always wants the good for me. She never wants the bad for me. You know, many people in this country have relationships where their wife only wants the bad for their husbands. And they use traditions and superstitions like, he isn't my soulmate. I need to find my soulmate. No, you need to find Jesus first. And then... You need to love that man who you're married to. You, you gave him vows. You vowed to him. Your vows mean nothing. And you know what? There we go again. You know, there's so many topics we could get on tonight. I mean, vows mean nothing. People lie. They lie to, their, to the one they say they love the most. They lie. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ never lied to us. It is impossible for God to lie. Praise the Lord for his faithfulness to us and a great example of what a husband ought to be to his wife and what a wife ought to be to her husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, well, Proverbs 31, and we're going to go to verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. You ready for this? There is more scriptural support for a woman working for someone than not working for someone. Right there, Proverbs 31, 14. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Go to verse What just happened here? Hopefully the, the stream didn't cut off on you guys. Uh, let, let's go ahead and read verse 15. She, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. How can she buy it? She buying it with her husband's money or she buying it with her money? 
with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. How can she buy a field and then with the fruit of her hands plant a vineyard? This leaves room for her working for someone else. Working for She's working for someone. See that? Now look at verse 17. Proverbs 31, 17. She girded her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. See? She, she's strengthening herself for her own work, for her own, for, for the things that she's doing with her hands. Verse 18, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Uh, what is she work? What if she is working a spindle at a factory? What if? You don't know. It doesn't say either or. But look, she's doing something right there. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She's working. Proverbs 31 20. She stretcheth, she stretched, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor. She, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid to the of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. So she can make fine linen while working for someone and then sell and, and then she selleth it to the merchant. What do we do? Come on, Proverbs 31. Bible says woman can work. Let me get work. Uh, uh, let, let, come on, let's keep going. Proverbs 31, 25. Strengthth and, uh, strength and honor are her clothing. Come on, isn't it great? Not only you got a working woman, but she's honorable. She's honorable. She's honorable in business. She's honorable to her husband. Her husband can trust her as she's out working. He can trust her that she's not going to go start an affair with some man. Well, this man's rich. Let me start an affair with him. Uh, look at this man. He's good looking. Let me start an affair with him. No, he can trust her. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. See, she's wise, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her husband. Just because a woman's kind to you doesn't mean she likes you. I, I just thought I'd say that, okay? Uh, so just, and come on. Just because a married woman is kind to you doesn't mean she wants to be with you. You got to say that nowadays, okay? She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. She's not lazy. She's not lazy like the sin of Sodom. Come on. Idleness. Idleness. Bread of idleness was one of the sins of Sodom. All right, Proverbs 31, 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Nothing wrong praising your wife. Nothing wrong praising if. Come on, look what she's doing. She's honorable. She's outworking. She's trying to do, oh, we're going to cover that. She's being the help meet. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her, her husband also, and her, he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Nothing wrong with excelling. Come on, excel. Be the best. Be the best wife you can be. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. See, people too busy trusting in their beauty. Favor. A lot of women seek after those things, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Because look at the attributes we just showed you in Proverbs 31. Who wouldn't want a woman like that? <laughs> They're hard to find, aren't they? Sure. Look at verse 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Give her the fruit of her hands. She's bringing in the bread. She's bringing in the bacon, amen. Come on, bring home that Tamworth pig, because I like Tamworth. We're going to chop that thing up. My wife going to help me, and we're going to cook some bacon, amen. All right. Well, Genesis 2.18, that's the one I wanted to cover. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. What good is a help meet if she can't meet him with help? 
Acts 9.36. Now there was at Joppa certain disciples named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Probably wouldn't name my little girl that, but this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Where did she get the alms? Where did she get the alms? Well, she's working, isn't she? Look at Acts 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And then you go to verse 15. And when she was baptized in her household, she, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into, watch, my house and abide there and she constrained us she had her own house she didn't say come into my husband's house this woman had her own house she's i make a lot of money had her own house so here's an established woman who had her own house because she was working a job luke 10 38 now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named martha received him into get ready her house so to have her, her house, a woman would have to work for food and clothing. And then when you go to Ruth 2.17, so she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her, her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was she was sufficed. And uh, verse 19, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she shewed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. So if a woman can only work from home, then why is God not rebuking Ruth for work working in Boaz's fields to make a living? <laughs> How are widows and single women supposed to survive if they can only work from home? Uh, nowhere in the Bible is a woman forbidden from working outside of the house, but according to Titus 2, 1 to 5, uh, look at this one. Uh, and what, just for the sake of time, because we're already a little bit over, Titus 2, 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, watch, keepers at home, home a good obedient to their own husbands that the word of god be not blasphemed because what happens if you're if, if you're violating all those things are you not blaspheming god you understand there's some guidelines here that we really need to consider i mean especially being a woman you need to consider these things uh this is showing how the aged women are teaching the young women principles in relationship to their marriage so what is a keeper at home Let's fly through some of this uh, for the sake of time. We're not going to be able to get too much detail. Keeper is one who keeps, one that holds or has possession of anything, uh, one who retains in custody, one who has the care of a prison and the custody of prisoners. So uh, I want you to focus on one who has the care. Uh, point two, one who has the care of a park or other enclosure or the custody of beasts as the keeper of a park, a pound or of sheep. Point three, one who has the care, custody, or superintendence of anything. So a keeper at the home would be someone who has the care of the home, not someone who is imprisoned in the home. It is possible for a woman to work and still be a keeper at home. Widowed men, think about this, widowed men who have kids are keepers at home while working abroad. What is being taught is principle not thou shalt not see that see, see how we did that all right let me try to see if i have anything else that i want to say do we have anything else i think we're good we're going to save uh just for interest for next week we're going to save michael odom's question and uh michael cody's question and now michael odom's question was hey brother ed i know it's late but i was uh reading in second corinthians or Second Chronicles 12 about Rehoboam. And in verse 14, the Bible says that he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. How do you prepare your heart to seek the Lord? Very good question. I think you're going to be surprised at the answer when I give it next week. Uh, Lord willing, uh, Brother Justin will be there too.
And then Michael Cody's question is, who are the saints in Revelation 13, 10 and Revelation 14, 12? So there it is. We're going to talk a little bit about those saints in, uh, excuse me, both of those verses. So, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Give you a little gospel message can never fail when you're talking about saints to give a gospel message there. So uh, look forward to that. So hopefully it's been helpful. You know, Jose Navarro's question was not easy, uh, an easy one to answer. But look at all the verses that we gave. Uh, if, if, if I, if I'll say I, you know, if a woman, uh, it wants to be one that professes godliness, a woman that wants to honor God in her life. Then here's some things to consider, not things to make you do them. Here's some things to consider. God loves you. He wants the best for you in your life. He wants the most safety for you in your life, the best life that you can live in your life. Um, blessings coming your way in your life. I don't see anything wrong with a woman that would want to obey as much as she can out of the word of God. And in this day and age, she would be a strange creature to the world, but to God, what a valuable, what a valuable pearl of great price. She would be to, to the Lord God himself, uh, obeying the word of God is, it's not a shame to do so. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, if you're a woman today, don't look at this thing as, man, you can't do this and you can't do that. Look at this thing as, look at what, look how God values me as a woman. Look at the value. Men don't get value like that. Men don't get value like that. Women are valued in who they are in the Lord. Men are valued in a different way. So don't feel bad about this. Don't, don't sit there and kick against the pricks on this thing. I'm telling you, unless you've experienced obedience to the Lord under all of the new Testament Christian conduct for a woman, I would be careful to condemn anything the Bible just said that we went over. And that's just a little bit. There's so much more we can cover about women. I'm we're just barely scratching the surface on this thing. Uh, women have a big role in the church. I, I, you're not minimized at all. God, I mean, if there's any religion in the world that values women the most, it's Christianity. It's God and Jesus Christ. Do you know the thing, the, the thing, the person, if you don't say collectively, the person that Jesus died for and made the church is his bride. How about that? He died for everyone. Any person can become part of the bride. But isn't it amazing how God views the church as a woman valued? And it's and the church is the pearl of great price. How about that? So just want to, to show you that uh, it, it's not a knockdown for us to go over all this stuff. It should be a blessing to you to know that, hey, you know, there, there may be jobs that I shouldn't do. <laughs> there may be things that are going to, be more of a man's job that I, I probably wouldn't want to do because I'm a woman. I'm a woman professing godliness and all of the attributes that I want to be don't line up with what society says that I, that I need to be as a woman. I don't want to go by what society says I should be. I want to go by what God says I should be. So there, there's a few things, maybe some encouragement, you know, points that I, I like to make here at the end. Uh, yeah. So hopefully, you know, you look into that, Go back, maybe watch the video again, look at the points that I've, I've given, and maybe do a study of, for yourself out of the Word of God, and you'll find that uh, there's a lot of great things about women in the Bible, a lot of things women did that, uh, I mean, Mary Magdalene, you know, first, first evangelist, went to preach the gospel. How about that? Some great things there. So, um, you know, uh, Mary, you know, mother of, of Jesus, you know, think about, think about her. You know, she was blessed. God called her blessed among women. There's a lot of great things in the Bible. And I mean, we're not going to do a whole, you know, we're not doing a whole study on women, but there's a lot of great things about women in the Bible. So all we're talking about is uh, if a woman wants to honor Jesus Christ, wants to honor God in the Bible, in Christian conduct, here's some things uh, you need to consider. I, I would say you need to consider. I mean, not telling you you have to, but consider those things if you really love Jesus Christ.
All right. All right. There it is. I'm going to end it there. I thank you, everybody, for your patience. You went with me through this whole spiel. Uh, a lot of great stuff that we covered, some background information, just so we could get to where we're at. I uh, hope that you take it in a good spirit. Um, I'm Come on. I'm not on here telling anybody what to do. We just want to see what the Bible says. So uh, God, this God, the mind of God, you know, I want to honor God in every area of my life. I hope you do too. So consider those things and uh, I'm going to end it there. I thank you guys for joining me on KJV Bible Scope, Monday night Bible Q&A. And may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great and wonderful evening.